me. Hi everyone, I'm Sue James and I'm a solicitor at Hammersmith and Fulham Law Centre. And I'm not really here today to talk about my story. I'm here to talk about lots of other people's stories because in my job, can you hear me? Is that okay? In my job, I get to hear and see lots and lots of stories. So if I wasn't here now, I would be at Brentford County Court right now representing people who are being evicted. And in a morning session, you might see about 50 cases. So that's one court in a tiny bit of London where 50 people are being evicted at any one time. And I think the reason why I'm here today is to kind of give you a little picture of my work, but also that the message that people's stories need to be told, that you know we have austerity at the moment. We don't need to have austerity. And actually, austerity only bites with the poorest in our community and not the richest in our community. And let's do something about that and let's start telling people's stories. So these are my clients that I see every day. So on a normal day, I would take instructions and get their story relay that to the judge, try and work out what's going on. And what I realise and what, what happens is that it's the first time that someone has actually done anything about their situation because taking the roof from someone's head, uh, above their head, is, is the first time that they start to address their problems. And what you find is that there's benefit problems, family issues, health issues, and there's a crisis, and they're stuck in that crisis, so they're not like the other speakers that we've heard so far that have managed to overcome adversity, but they're stuck right in the middle of that kind of mire of like gunky kind of life has taken over and they haven't got a voice and they're invisible. So what I try to do is to give them a voice. Um, and if I give you a flavor of the kind of cases and the kind of poverty that we're actually seeing at the moment, a uh, client of mine has only one light bulb. She moves it from room to room at night in order to have light in her home. That's a choice that she makes because of benefit sanctions. So the first time I saw her, she hadn't had any benefit for about four months and been borrowing money. Um, and it's at the point where she can't pay her rent, the council were evicting her, that she then has to do something about it. And because there's a duty scheme, I get to be there and to represent. So that's the kind of case. We see cases, there's a, you know, only not long ago there was a woman who was being taken to court because she got um, bedroom tax, um, because she got a spare room. The reason she got the spare room was because her daughter had died on holiday. She drowned with her grandparents. And it's kind of like you think, well, how does she get up in the morning, let alone face the fact that she's going to lose her home? because her daughter doesn't live with her anymore. Um, you know, I had my first shed case. We've heard about those cases um, in Ealing where the landlord was charging 650 pounds for a shed in his garden that had <laughs> the most basic facilities um, and um, had an infestation of rats, kind of no heating or whatever. Um, and it was fine while he was working, when he lost his job. Of course, the landlord said you can't claim benefits because everyone would then find out that he's actually, um, you know, got a shed in his garden that wasn't lawful. Anyway, so what I do in those cases, in that case, we got, managed to get it struck out. He was a vulnerable man, young man. Um, we got him some support and we got him rehousing. So it's kind of like, so telling someone's story to the judge, getting someone's story out there is like really important. And why do I do it? So um, recently a friend of mine quoted, and I'll read this out, Sue has spent more or less her entire working life in underpaid, overworked jobs in shabby offices with few, few resources to fight the corner of the dispossessed, repossessed, and the mentally ill and the poor. Um, so that kind of, not very glamorous, I'm afraid. <laughs> And it certainly wasn't what I intended when I started out back in 1989 when I became a solicitor. Um, but I wanted to use the law to change it for good. And I think that by working in the law center, I'm able to do that and able to give people a voice and to make the law, kind of use the law to make it better for other people. So central to my work 
is to find the story and to give the client a voice and to show you know, that people are real and they're not just a case or they're not just invisible. Um, and when you uncover that difficulty that they have and start to tell their story, they become real. Um, and an example that um, I'll give you now is a, a case that was incorporated into a play about legal aid and the cuts to legal aid last year. And it was a, a man who um, was being evicted because he had a dog. Um, and you think, well, that just sounds terrible. Why would you be evicted because you've got a dog? But he was a chronic alcoholic and he couldn't walk the dog. So the dog was, you can imagine, in, in the premises what he was doing. Um, and so there was a whole catalogue of, of photographs and reasons why this man should be evicted. Um, he was really tall, gaunt, dishevelled, very gentle man. And I just thought, well, why? He wouldn't give up the dog. And so he was facing eviction. And so, you know, I needed to uncover the reason why. And what I found is that the dog was the embodiment of everything that he'd lost in his life. And he'd been a, a really successful cameraman, came from um, South Africa, came to the UK to kind of make his fortune met a woman from America, they had a child, and she went back to America and he brought the boy up alone. And when he was 18, he went to see his mom in America and got killed in a car accident. So my client became an alcoholic and just his life fell away. And so, you know, when you looked at him, when he came to court, he hadn't washed in a long time. He looked very disheveled and gaunt and, and, and not very together. And people didn't want to sit next to him but he's a real person who had this tragedy in his life. And I tried my best, I was like thinking, right, how can we get the dog walked? What can we do? How can we kind of make this situation better, you know, uh, for him? Because it just seemed so extreme. Um, the, the dog was called Guinness as well, so it kind of like <laughs> didn't, really, <laughs> didn't really help the situation. Anyway, we managed to get a friend to agree to have the dog, um, and then we kind of organised a deal, and the judge approved it. Um, this was December two years ago. Um, by April, the dog was still seen in the property, and so they were the landlords were enforcing the warrant. So we went back to court, and on this day, I agreed to have the dog <laughs> rather than him be evicted. Uh, luckily, I didn't need to, but because uh, his friend agreed again to take the dog, but I gave an undertaking to get the dog out of his flat and give him to his friend's flat and an undertaking to the court is a promise and if you don't do it you can go to prison so i drove my client and his friend to the house to get the dog and no one had keys to get in so we almost had to break in <laughs> with a ladder to, into the property to get the dog out and then take him to his friend's house that was fine so we did that kind of and um anyway cut to a year later and there's more evidence that the dog has been seen at the property. <laughs> so these things never go away. And obviously he loves this dog so much and it's so central to his life. Anyway, cut to a year later and I'm before the judge saying, sir, you know, the dog doesn't live there anymore. Occasionally he might go, but please don't evict him for that reason because you really don't know how far we've moved on with this case in this circumstance. Anyway, we were fine. So, um, but his friend is now being evicted. And I said, oh, how's Ronald and the dog? And he went, I'd better not tell you had I sue. So <laughs> I suspect that he's somewhere near that vicinity. Um, so why a law centre? So you might not know about law centres. Law centres, there's 43 in England and Wales. They came about in the 1970s to help local people with local needs and respond. Um, they provide free advice at the point of contact to people who live or work in their areas. And so it's an opportunity, we get grant funding as well, so it's an opportunity to do lots of like local community work and partner with all the kind of other advice agencies. And I get to run the advice forum in Hammersmith and Fulham. So it means that you can do really good joined up work for your clients. Um, so that's where I've kind of my background is. Um, so why tell stories? I think everyone here today was interested in coming because there were stories to be told. And uh, some of the stories we've heard so far have been really inspirational. And, and I'm sure you're going to hear lots more later on. And for me, it's kind of like Dickens, Charles Dickens told stories to highlight the condition of the poor. 
And I think they're still as relevant today as they were. And what we're seeing is that the, the, the workhouse has been replaced by the food bank. And in my area, we're getting more and more food banks. They're not decreasing. And it's kind of like, what can we do about this? You know, this isn't right that people are relying on food banks. You know, they have a right to benefits or a right to work, not to have zero hours contracts that mess up their benefits and they can't sustain their families. Um, but we also tell stories to kind of challenge the media perceptions because in my work, my clients get seen as like lazy and scroungers and, and we need to change all of that because they're not, you know, my clients aren't, you know, the Daily Mail will get a story. I remember one story where the Daily Mail said that, you know, we need to cut child benefit because one woman had a boob job because on collecting her child benefit. This is a few years ago and it's kind of like extreme cases are used as a reason to stop people having the right to their benefits and that's wrong. Um, so we also need to show what austerity is doing in our communities and it really is biting hard and I, the, the clients that we have are invisible, you know, people don't know that they're not able to live on the, the money that they're getting, that they have to keep on coming for vouchers for the food bank and so I think you know, telling those stories about the clients that are invisible are really important because poverty reduces people. It means that families can't be together, people lose their homes. And I, that just kind of, we need to think of ways of how we can change that and challenge it. Um, and one example, you know, I talked to someone who was at The Guardian recently and I said to him, why isn't The Guardian reporting, you know, these examples? And he said, well, people are just tired of listening to the austerity debate and I think well I'm not tired of listening to that but one example he gave was that trying to think of new angles of stories that we tell and he gave an example of going up north to visit a food bank and he was told by the worker there that people were actually coming who were hungry who were refusing the parcels that were given out and he just thought this was really bizarre and so he said well, why is this and he said well the worker said, well, people haven't got facilities for cooking, so they can't take away the parcels that we give them. So now we have three types of food parcels. We have a dry one for people who don't even have electricity. We have a kettle one for people who have got facilities for boiling water, and then we have the usual one for people who've got cooking facilities. And he said, I was able to report that because that's a new story. I mean, it's a horrific story. It's kind of like, it's outrageous, you know? So it's kind of like telling those stories about invisible things that are connected with people's lives. Um, and one of the biggest areas that there's been cuts back in my area was legal aid in 2013. And back in 1948, when we got the NHS, uh, set up, there was also the Legal Aid Act that gave everybody the right to equality of arms. You could have a solicitor to advise you on any aspect of law. And three years ago, the coalition government took that away and only left a very tiny proportion of legal aid for people. So my job is to try and, can we get that back? I don't know. We've got a Labour government that doesn't seem to be fighting the austerity agenda, just seems to be fighting themselves and you know so I think it's up to us to change that and to do something about it um, so I've been told that I've got like a couple of minutes now so I think you know let's make a change let's never give up that's my mantra there's always something that you can do and you know I suppose the question is do we need a revolution I think probably are we going to get one probably not so <laughs> I think I'll leave you there thank you